Jesus, that name above every other name. At your feet we fall humble, desperately wanting not only a relationship with you, but that for all of our friends and our family members. For those that do not know you or that do know you but are far from you. For those that you know, don't really care or just kind of whatever about you. Lord, we pray for those relationships, those connections that we have, that they would fall desperately for you. That they would come to know you. That not only they would believe in you, but that they would trust in you. I think it's one thing to believe but another thing to follow, to actually trust you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to follow you with all abandon. I think that's hard. Hard for anybody, really. But it's not just about a head knowledge. It's about about a heart that, that actually trusts the things that you say and to live it out. Help us to do that. Help us to be a light for our family and our friends, for our co-workers and our uh, people that we casually uh, know. That people would see a different in us, difference in us, not, not because of anything that we do, but because of something that you've done in us. Because of your Holy Spirit actively working through our lives. live like you. Lord, for those that are struggling, for those that are depressed, or for those that are anxious, we speak the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord. Help them to know that you are there, that you care, that you hear their prayer, that you love them. You are not a distant God, but you are right there walking alongside them. Lord, help us. Help us to confess the things that are going on in our minds and our hearts, those actions that we should not be doing. Not only to you, but to a, to a brother or sister, to someone that... that knows us and loves us as well. It's your word that says that confession brings healing. And we need that healing touch today. For those that are sick and they're tired, for those that are struggling, give them a touch. all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. A lot of things to talk about today that I want to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, first and foremost, I, there's going to be a meeting directly following the service about our, our Jeremiah Gray connection. So we want to be able to talk about that and kind of cement some things and be able to answer questions and and whatever that that you guys are kind of thinking and and, uh, just bring those uh, questions uh, after the service. So we'll we'll, uh, conclude service, we'll have a couple minute break, and then we'll meet right back here uh, following that. Also, Alpha training. So any of you that are interested... Some of you might not know a lot about Alpha because we've just kind of been starting to bring it in. 
um, but it's basically going to be something that we're going to have once a month on the first Wednesday of the month, and we're probably going to do it in the old sanctuary around round tables or, or, or something of the like. Uh, there's not a lot of details right now, but if you want to know more and be trained in that, um, those round tables are going to eat, we're going to watch video, and then we're going to talk about it with our table. So hopefully we'll have four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe eventually 20 tables or something. I don't know. Uh, and and uh, be able to have a bunch of small group kind of conversations around tables. And we'd love to have everybody be a part of that. I know Sarah's going to be bringing her youth, uh, the, the, the child to be uh, youth to that. Um, so that's going to be part of the round table. And we're going to, like, they're not going to be at their own secluded tables. Um, the youth, they're going to be mixed uh, amongst us. So, so it's just going to be a good time to, to, to get to know each other and to, to be able to learn the basics of Christianity because that's what the curriculum is focused on, the basics of Christianity. So if you want to be part of that training, uh, we're going to be doing that Wednesday at 7. Um, so a lot of stuff to cover in the next month because that's going to be uh, starting uh, the first Wednesday in September. So first Wednesday in September. There's a bunch of other stuff here. Um, also, we're going to be starting uh, 21 days of prayer. We do this somewhat frequently, but not always the same schedule. E every year is a little bit different. Uh, but this year, it's basically the month of August, and, and it technically starts today and going to be going through uh, the next uh, basically four weeks. So I know that it's a little bit more than 21 days of prayer, uh, but we're going to be getting uh, in that. So every Wednesday and Sunday, we're going to have specific times of prayer. But I would also encourage you, too, um, to, to, to individually uh, pray on your own. Um, I know everyone does, but have a little bit more focus on, on prayer for the church. But also, if, if you have a friend or, or, or a small group that you want to pray with, ha ha have a weekly uh, time. Uh, set up, or maybe you want to even Zoom too, because you can't meet together physically. Um, Zoom or FaceTime uh, prayer uh, with each other, and uh, so that schedule is right there in front of you, um, and you can uh, be part of that. So today we are going to be in Second Chronicles six and seven. That those are the chapters, not. The verses, so we're going to cover a lot, but we're not going to do all the reading of six and seven because that would take uh, quite a bit. But we're, we got a lot to cover. But there's one specific verse that we are going to look at in chapter six and seven over the next four weeks that will kind of draw this whole series together. Uh, and so you've probably heard of this uh, verse before, and you've probably heard it in in a lot of memes over the last uh, few years, because I think a lot of people are specifically looking at maybe even the U.S. A a as this nation, right? This nation that, that um, needs to get back to God. And, and so people are, 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 are focusing, what if we did this? But I think because this verse is, is usually taken out of context, but if we know the context, at least we'll know the origin story a little bit better. And, and so we let, let, let's check out uh, verse 14 of chapter 7. You've probably heard it before. Then if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Like I said, uh, you've probably heard that. So let's dive deeper into actually the context of this verse, and we're going to be talking about it for the next uh, four weeks. Uh, Naphtali is going to be preaching about it next week, and, and over the next uh, couple weeks I'll take it after that. Uh, but with that, let's pray. Uh, Lord, you are so good. You are so awesome, you are so powerful, so mighty. I just want us to open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to what you and your word 
have to say. You say it's in your name. Amen. So you've probably also heard the phrase, hindsight is twenty twenty. In other words, looking back at your past, you can see what you did wrong, and you can't change it, but you wish that you could have done something different to have changed that. I'm sure a lot of times you, you, you said that, I, I wish I could go back and change that decision. I wish I had not have done that. I wish I had not said those things. I wish I had not done that uh, to that person. I, I wish I, I had done something different. In other words, looking back and, and saying what we should have done is easier than having uh, enough courage or even foresight to what we should have done in the moment. Now, our kids love the show Full House. Have you ever seen the show Full House? The the, the early 90s sitcom that, that, that had this, this family lose their mother. So, so Bob Saget plays Danny. Danny invites his two best friends uh, to come and live with them to, to help raise their daughter. Our kids love the show. I, I, if, if, if I realized back in the 90s when I was growing up and watching this, that it would still stay around for 30 plus years later, I, I would have been shocked. But because of Disney Plus, we have that ability to be able to, to, to watch any episode at any time you want, 24-7, 365, and on leap year 366 days. This past week or a couple weeks ago, maybe now, they were watching a specific episode where, where, where Joey made a mistake. And I'm sure every episode has someone making a mistake. But I wish... He, he, he probably realizes what that mistake was, and he'll probably never make it again. But it,
but but you did not receive a title from that little old lady with two eyes, right? <laughs> like Joey obviously would never make that mistake again. Hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Joey learned an important lesson, and Second Chronicles is basically a, a, a look back on the history of of the Israelites. It's actually written a uh, hundred years after the the story of Second Chronicles ends, and, and Second Chronicles is actually takes place over a period of four hundred plus years. So so five hundred years after the start of Second Chronicles is when it's written. So so it's really being being written uh, to to the Israelites of the future. They 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 have this history put together of what happened back then. So so that period is from 970 BC to 586 BC. Nine the first nine chapters focuses on Solomon and his reign uh, of 40 years and, and, and his building of the temple. And here we're at the, the, the dedication of the temple. The rest of the book focuses on the kings and, and the division and, and eventually the fall of Jerusalem and, and, and uh, the devastation of, of the fall of, of the temple. But it was another 100 years um, before Second Chronicles was written. Now, Second Chronicles is, is communicating with, with Israel after returning to Israel, rebuilding that same temple and the wall. And this is a history book of them helping to understand their past, that to, to, to look back and know what they did previously so they don't do it again. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Edmund Burke is, is quoted as saying, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. Maybe you didn't know who it was quoted for. Maybe you've heard it quoted as Winston Churchill, but someone said it before Winston did. And uh, Mark Twain says something similar. History does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. I, I like that because usually it's not the same way or the same exact way, but, but, but it might sound similar or feel similar in a lot of ways. Israel throughout their history has made a lot of mistakes. But it is interesting, even with, with, with the hindsight that they have, they continue to make similar rhymes or, or mistakes, even today. right? They were a theocracy at first, a, a nation led by God that he created. And then they appointed judges, and, and eventually when they asked for a king, he relented. He, he, he gave them a king, but they were still considered a theocracy. The king was supposed to go back and, and, and talk to about with God. And, and, and a lot of times, though, the people just kind of did what they wanted. A lot of times they, they were swayed by a good king to, to follow God, and a bad king would lead them astray, and they would do stuff. People could be easily misled to doing wrong in which they they think is good based on the rhetoric of the leader, right? And the, what he says or, or, or does. Chapter 7 says that it takes place during the completion of the original temple. And, and so here they are dedicating this temple to God. And it has actually four different parts. Solomon addressing the Israelites, Solomon's prayer uh, to God, uh, the de dedication or worship there, and uh, God actually answering Solomon's prayer. Now, Solomon addresses the assembly of Israel, and, and he talks about how God gave his father David, right? So Solomon is, is, is the son of David, King David. And those are some hard shoes to fill, right? Like following after the footsteps of your dad, who's basically still the greatest king that was ever uh, at, of Israel. So, so he takes over for him. And, and, and God gave David the, the, this vision for the temple, but he told David that he wasn't going to be able to build it himself, that one of his sons would. And, and so Solomon, who eventually became king, uh, four years after he became king, he actually started building the temple. And, and, and the building uh, 
building the temple took seven years. So th- this is a lot of time. This is not something like our day day of construction. It takes a year or two and, you know, build it and, and, and uh, it, it finished quickly. But this is something that took time. A- a- and he did um, an amazing job uh, with it. Second Chronicles 6.13, this, this is what uh, he said right after he, he, he uh, addressed Israel. This is starting into the prayer. He stood on the platform, and then he knelt uh, in front of the entire community of Israel and lifted his hands towards heaven. He prayed, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven and earth. You keep your covenant and show unfailing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. You made the promise with your own mouth and with your own hand, and you have fulfilled it today. Right? Solomon takes the time to posture himself. He, he gets on his knees. There, there, there is this humility. There is this, this reverence for, for God as, as Solomon kneels in prayer and lifts his hands in front of Israel. He lowers himself. He humbles himself. He he exalts God of heaven. And he says, no one is like you anywhere, heaven or earth. No one is anyone like you. He shows his reverence for God. He tells him, you keep your word, right? You, You have done everything that you have said you would do. You have made this promise with your mouth and your hands have fulfilled it. Solomon adds some requests. After he he takes the time to worship, after he takes the time uh, to adore God, he he has some requests for him. In verse 16, it says that, God, you would keep your promise to to, to David, that you will always have someone on the throne of Israel from our family. And in verse 19, that God would give us the attention to to, to our servant's prayer and, and, and plead for mercy, that his eyes would be open toward the temple day and night, that he would hear the supplications of the servant and your people and when they pray uh, toward this day. And that when you hear these prayers, that you would forgive. I, I love this, this, this prayer. He really wants uh, God to continue his blessing on Israel. But then Solomon gets a little bit more specific. He says, when a man wrongs his neighbor, dot, dot, dot. And, 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 and uh, you can read the rest of that prayer. But then he says, when Israel is defeated by their enemies, or when there's a drought, or when famine or plague comes, or, or when your people go to war, or when they sin against you. Now, some of your Bibles, especially if those, those of you are reading in the NLT, it says if. Now, there is a big difference between when and if, right? So so I did a little bit of background check because throughout this chapter, there's a lot of ifs and whens. Because if it is more hypothetical, if this happens, or, 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 or when it happens. Sure always, right? There, there's a difference between if and when. And so there are actually three different words in Hebrew that can be translated to if and when just in these two chapters alone. And, and so uh, it's interesting it, it, that some Bibles will say if or when in the same place. So I was trying to f- do a little bit more research on those specific words that were being used in Hebrew. And, and I think the NLT is, is wrong on this one, so so it's but it's okay, it's okay, it's not a big big deal. So so Solomon is really saying, when Israel messes up, when Israel messes up, please do this, and this is what he says, verse thirty six through thirty nine, when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, right? And you become angry with them. 
and give them over to their enemies. So he's already saying, like, he, there, he sees this exile happening. Before it even happens, he, he sees this exile happening, who takes them captive to a land far away or near. And if they have a change of heart, and that's important, if, right? If they have a change of heart, because I don't think it's a when there. I, th- I think it, it's supposed to be an if. So if, hypothetically, they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity and say we have sinned, we have done wrong and acted wicked, wickedly, and if they turn their turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of captivity where they, they were taken, and pray toward the land you gave their fathers, toward the city you have chosen, and toward the temple I have built for your name. Then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayers and their pleas, and uphold their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Now, I don't think Solomon is, is asking for special treatment. He knows Israel is going to eventually sin. Why? Because all people sin. That's what Solomon said. All people sin, and it's going to eventually happen that the Israelites will sin. It's inevitable that they will wander from God. But then it switches, right? It it becomes hypothetical again. If they change, have a change of heart, if they turn back to you, if they realize they messed up, basically, if if they repent and plead, Right, sin basically is inevitable. Repentance is not inevitable. Everyone's going to mess up. Everyone's going to fall short of the glory of God, right? That's scripture. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. But their repentance is not necessarily going to happen. It's not surely going to happen. Right? We have all sinned. But If they turn back to you, please, God, hear them and forgive them. May your eyes be open to them. May your ears be attentive to them. And it says, when Solomon finished praying, that fire came down. You can go right at the beginning of chapter 7. That fire came down and consumed the burnt offering. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. In verse 3 of chapter 7, it says, When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. So over the next seven days, they sacrificed 22,000 cattle. They sacrificed 120,000 sheep and goats. Aren't you glad that worship has changed a little bit? That we don't have to do that anymore? Like, can you imagine? This is one of the biggest sacrifices that has ever happened, right? It's, it, it's all about Solomon saying, thank you, God, and the Israelites saying, thank you, God, for, for, for bringing us to this point. Thank you, God, for for allowing this temple to be built. This is all about you. This is all about your goodness. Your love endures forever. And then God appears to Samuel and the Israelites. Verse 11 of chapter 7, it says, I have heard your prayer, right? I I love this, right? Because I think every now and then we need assurance that God hears our prayer. And Solomon now can say without a shadow of a doubt that God heard his prayer, that he cares about his prayer, that he was willing to listen. And before I go any further, you can be sure that God hears your prayers too. He cares about your prayers, and and he is with you in your prayers. And these words were not just meant for Samuel or the Israelites, but it's These words are meant for every person that's ever prayed. And God addresses those prayers. He he addresses those specific prayers that Solomon prayed, specifically about the drought and the famine and the plagues. And then he says the famous line or, or, or verse that I read earlier, if my people 
who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and restore their land. I love this verse with my people. But he's saying it when Israel's in a good spot. He's saying it in in a place where, where Israel is not actually far from him. But he's saying, if they do, if they fall away, if they get go into exile, if all these different things happen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and restore their land. I will heal their land. God calls Israel to do three things. Humble themselves and pray, seek his face, and turn from their wicked ways. Now, going back to that idea of if being hypothetical, right? This is a big if. It's a very specific if. If my people at this time, right, is Israel. That's the only people that were his people. Every Everyone else, the whole world, were not his people. But eventually would tra- take trajectory to that. But at this time, Israel were the only people of his. And at this time, uh, he is addressing Israel in response to Solomon's prayer. He's not addressing those who are far from God. He's not addressing anybody else except the nation of Israel, who at this time were his people. And he's also speaking hypothetically, right? Because at the time, they were following him. But in the future, if they turn their back, and and they do, right? Because because Solomon said it's inevitable. If they're people, they're going to turn their back. And if they do, they humbly humble themselves and pray that they seek his face, turn from their wicked ways, and then God will respond in three different ways to us. He said, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will restore their land, right? He always hears their prayer. We know that. We we. We, we have the assurance that God actually does hear our prayers and that he will forgive their sin, that he will restore, right? Like this is God's ideal scenario. He wants the Israelites to repent to him. He wants them, if they wander off, to come back to him. And, and over the next three weeks, we're going to dig deeper into this verse, what is meant for 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 the people of Israel. Because there's something about it. There's something about it. And what it means for us today. But if you take away anything today, know this. That God hears your prayers. That God is with you when you're praying them. That God cares about you. So this week, I encourage you to pray your prayers. Maybe even a little bit differently than you normally do. With assurance that God hears you, that he cares for you, and that he will respond. To pray big, odd, bold, audacious prayers. To pray for those that, that, that need salvation. For those that need healing. For those that, that, that are struggling. For those that may have a, a, a depression or anxiety. For those that, 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 that are weak and, and are struggling, for those that um, have no aim or purpose in their life, for those that, that are struggling, for, for, for peace amongst uh, people, for, for, for nations, for, for world peace. Pray for, for hunger to cease. Pray for uh, miracles to be abundant. To pray big, bold, audacious prayers. Because no prayer is too big for God uh, to, 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 to answer. No prayers are too small that God doesn't care about those prayers. God cares for you and your prayers. And that also, uh, since we're entering in that season of, of 21 days of prayer, I, I, I feel like I need to remind you to set your clocks at 3.20 p.m. or 3.20 a.m. too if you want. Um, I'm not going to do that. But if you want to get up 3.20 a.m. or if you're already up at 3.20 a.m. Uh, to, 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 to pray a prayer for the church, for, for, for those things that, that are on your heart, for those that, that, that you have concerned about. 
And why why 3:20? Because of Ephesians 3:20 is kind of our prayer that now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Worship team, please come up and close with your last song today. Let us pray. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to what concerns you. So many times we come to you in prayer. And we pray our heart. Help us to come to you in prayer and pray your heart. Help us to know what is is your concern. What is your care? What are the things that we should be praying for, for Southview, for our family, for, for our neighbors? What are the things that we should be concerned about? Lord, we need you. We need everything about you. So Lord, change us. Mold us. Make us more like you. We pray in your name. Amen. Would you stand? And this is our prayer that our praise would add weight to his glory. Surely God is with you. He's with you each and every moment, each and every step of the way. So take assurance that God is with you and that God does hear your prayers. Go today, go uh, love, live, and serve like Jesus and continue to have your eyes open to, to, to how Jesus sees the world through God.